Okay. There we go. Hopefully that. Okay, thank you. Um, participants are required to sign up to speak using the name they are commonly known by and individuals must display their whole name before being allowed to speak online. Currently only audio testimony is permitted online. And then we do have two options for public comment tonight. We can do, uh, we have an in-person option and online. If you're joining online, you'll need to raise your hand to speak if you haven't signed up in advance. To do that, um, you'll either see the raise hand icon at the bottom of your screen, or you'll be able to click the participants icon. You'll see three dots at the bottom right. Click on that and you'll see the option to raise your hand. If you would like to speak in person tonight, if you could please sign up, there's a sign up sheet at the bottom down here by me. Um, and you can either sign up for the first section, which is items not identified for public comment, or the one item tonight that is identified for public for public comment. Okay. Um, and with that, I will uh, stop sharing the presentation. Thank you. So before I open the, uh, the public comment, um, the item that is on our agenda for uh, a public hearing is rather lengthy and entitled, but I'll, I will read it so everyone understands uh, what that uh, public hearing will consist of. The item is request for approval and recommendation to city council to approve a request by public service company of Colorado doing business as Excel Energy and, and on behalf of Comcast Xfinity, CenturyLink, Lumen, in the city of Boulder innovation and technology department to use certain city of Boulder open space lands to install and maintain subsurface electric and telecommu telecommunication utilities via open trenching or boring pursuant to the disposal procedure of article 12 section 177 of the city of Boulder charter. So that will be our public hearing. If you wish to comment on that, there will be an opportunity for you to do that at the time. Uh, Otherwise, uh, we will entertain uh, any comments from the public right now. Okay. Thank you. And I'm just going to check to see if we have anyone signed up for in advance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks. <clears throat> Sam, do we have anyone? We do. We have uh, two folks signed up to speak in advance, so I'll get going um, with okay. those two, and then we'll we'll return to hands. Okay. So we'll get started with Lauren Clark. And Lauren, you should be able to unmute yourself. Yes, I am. Thank you, Sam. Hi everyone. Um, I'm not sure what my time box is, so I'll try and be concise. I am a lifelong Boulder resident here and I am specifically calling out today about the access to our open space mountain parks by dogs. It has become unruly and unsafe and we really desperately need some enforcement here out at our open space mountain parks. Um, it's gotten so busy. I see that we've opened it up to non-residents for a $75 fee. And I understand that is likely because of the drop in revenue in 2022, but people don't care. And as a lifelong resident, it is extremely hard to watch something you truly love and appreciate literally get trashed by people. Um, if you've been out to dry Creek trailhead lately, it boomed during the pandemic and got to the point it is wildly out of control. There's physical trash. You may remember when they did the flags for all the unpicked up poop. That was atrocious. So I'm really here asking as the trustees, as the people, the residents of Boulder have entrusted with this land that you go ahead and please help us enforce these rules. I've always participated in the voice and sight program, but without any enforcement, it doesn't seem to matter. Um, my dog has been charged, attacked, all the things we advocate not to do in the training, and there's no repercussions. So as a resident, I'm paying the vet bills. I'm going through. Our areas are packed. We truly need enforcement. If you see somebody without a tag, ticket them. If you see another dog charging 
other dogs tar- like ticket them if they're charging the livestock in places like Cherryvale. We have to get on this and ticket it. People aren't renewing their tags because there's no enforcement. I truly thought about that. You're like, okay, well, if nobody cares, why do I keep paying? And I pay to train my dog. I pay all these things. And people from all over the state and all over the world are coming using these things, but there's no enforcement. So I'm here tonight begging you, please start enforcing these programs. You've put so much thought into creating them. And we, as a resident, we want these to work, but right now it's not working and we really need some enforcement around the tags, the behavior. Um, I noticed in your fees, it's not about, you don't have enforcement. It's just listed as education. Like maybe it's time to set aside some budget and focus on the enforcement of these. Um, Not sure here what the structure is, if there's time for comment, time for questions, what that looks like from your end. Great, thank you for those comments. Thank you. Um, Next, we have signed up Joyce Fraley. Joyce, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Joyce, are you able to unmute yourself? Okay. Um, I'll yeah. move on to the. I think I. Just, there we go. I there, apologize. Oh, we can hear you now. There we go. Thanks. Okay, good. I apologize for that. Um, first time using Zoom for this capacity. So um, I just wanted to thank the trustees for the opportunity to speak this evening. Um, my name is Joyce Fraley, and I'm a resident of Gun Barrel. Um, And while I realize this is a city of Boulder open space and mountain parks um, meeting, um, I wanted to spend a couple minutes chatting about a Boulder County special use application that I know has been referred to the city of Boulder open space and mountain parks as a referral agency. Um, The application is for um, special use, excuse me, the application number is 23-0016. Some may have heard about it. It's for a membership tennis facility in unincorporated Boulder County near Gun Barrel Hill. And the reason that I feel it's important for the trustees to know about this project is that the area surrounding this project is made up of both city and county open space and mountain parks land. So I feel it's really an important community decision. Um, As I've learned more about my neighborhood through those individuals that are long-term residents here, um, what I've learned, and I think maybe some of you know, but but maybe some of you don't, is that back in 1993, gun barrel um, citizens became heavily involved in working to protect and preserve land in this area. Um, They proposed two ballot initiatives, both of which um, went forward, but one of them was intended to reduce the potential for additional development in the gun barrel area, which had become a really big concern to the community. So that ballot initiative passed um, the collection for an expenditure of $1.9 million for purchase of open space and land in and around gun barrel. And then subsequent to that in 1994, um, what then became known as the district, the Gun Barrel General Improvement District, um, worked to get $3.6 million in general obligation bonds issued. Over the next nine years, six acquisitions were done, purchasing 256 acres of land. And I understand that that land is still being held as agricultural lands managed by Boulder County Parks and Open Space. So the community and residents of Gun Barrel are deeply invested in protecting rural lands and open space in the areas in which we live. While we understand that an agricultural zoned property, which has been approved for a single family residence, can under special use be approved for a membership club tennis facility, I believe that it's an over-intensive use of this land. Um, Because it is somewhat adjacent 
I can't recall if it's directly adjacent to city open space. Um, invariably, there will be balls that are going to be hit over those tennis court um, fences, and they're going to roll down the hill on to open space. That's a question we have into the planners right now as to how those balls are going to be retrieved and not disturb the prairie dogs and other um, wildlife that's in that area. Um, that whole area, as you probably know, Gun Barrel Hill is incredibly rich with wildlife and environmental um, elements. So Joyce, we're very... Joyce, Joyce yeah. uh, your three minutes are up. So can you wrap okay. up your comments, please? Sure. Thank you. Yeah, we just wanted to say we're concerned about the light, noise, and traffic pollution as it's going to affect the surrounding city and county open space. And just want to say that we hope it's on the trustees' radar to weigh in on this really important issue. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, thank you. And we do have one person signed up to speak for this section in person. So I will go to that person and then we'll come back to hands online. Um, so signed up in person, we have Lynn Siegel. Lynn, if you could go to the, um, yep, there you go, podium. Yeah, um, ditto for the previous person. And, you know, this is an example, again, of CU's dominion over, over the city of Boulder. Um, the millennium, um, the tennis courts taken out there and CU South tennis courts taken out there. And we need neighborhood tennis courts. We need, one. it's great to have one kept at CU South and it's great to have one kept at the Millennium. And those are both causing a lot of distress to in terms of congestion, carbon footprint and all. Um, so um, I know how you guys are gonna vote on OSBT. I'm really upset still about Caroline Miller getting bumped off the board. I'm really, really not gonna ever forgive that, ever, ever, ever. That was completely unbelievable. I don't trust any boards anymore, much less this one. I know how you're gonna vote. You're gonna vote for the land disposal, but then we've got 60 days to get together a petition against disposal of that land. CU South is the worst disaster that can ever be put before the city of Boulder, increasing our population 30 some thousand, much more. CU's just salivating on it already. I'm sure all the life sciences buildings out in East Business Park, this is just horrific for Boulder. This is not, Boulder is not the center of CU. CU has other campuses they can expand in other places. This is a small town. My dad thought it was way too big when he moved here in 1948, okay? So let's not destroy this place. No CU. And I pray anyone that's listening that they sign this petition and that we can get this reversed. And I know how you're gonna vote. I know exactly how you're gonna vote. I don't doubt it for a second, but you're foolish vote that way. Thank you, Lynn. Okay, and I'm going to go back to hands on uh, Zoom. So uh, we have a hand up from Travis Hugh Culley. And Travis, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Um, and let me start with thank yous. I want to acknowledge this board for um, allowing me the option to raise my hand and give a public comment. It shows that you have some genuine interest in public feedback. I've got a comment um, about the Marshall Mesa area that should be uh, hair raising. So I'm gonna try and state my comment clearly and carefully. Um, the Marshall fire, I believe um, was, was fed by deeper causes. There was the say, uh, there was ERC, that's the analytic um, acronym talking about the energy available in the environment during the burn. I'm referring directly to the Marshall Fire um, facilitated learning analysis and how it gave us uh, um, the tools to think about the fire. It's interesting how in depth the precaution was and when when we the investigation concluded it was two dimensional it wasn't five dimensional um like all the other um 
analysis that we had about the fire immediately, really immediately thereupon, um, by October of the next year, we had the, the learning analysis. And um, it said that, that it said nothing about the plutonium factory that's just about half a mile away from Marshall Lake. Now there's a, Rocky Flats is an old news thing, but it's very naive of Boulder County to think on, by their words, by Rocky Flats um, own uh, assurances that this land is safe. I lived as a boy in Arvada. My father came home from work one day. He said something that I would remember for the rest of my life. And pardon me if I hope that you'll remember this statement too. He said, if they ever wanna know where the toxic waste is, tell them they're dumping it in Marshall Lake. Now, my dad worked for a bank in downtown Denver and a fellow of his called him at work and said, Dave, you gotta see this. This coworker had left an hour before. So my father takes the, takes the call and is peaked and he drives, instead of driving up 36 to Superior, where, I mean, to Arvada, where I lived, he would be on Superior Avenue. Um, he went around to Golden, drove up 93, took a right on Marshall Road, and he saw what he said was people dumping 55 gallon barrels, 50 gallon barrels. And, you know, I'm just being in recollection as accurate as I can be, um, into Marshall Lake, you know, from the Cowder Dam, I believe. Um, and, um, and he was, he was pale as a board, you know, um, and we left that area within a year. He, he actually tried to get out of there in six months and, um, it, it nearly separated my family. Um, and they worked their stuff out and, uh, and, and I would leave that area in the spring of 1980. So, um, digging in this area in terms of burying cable may resuspend this plutonium. I'm saying that the area around Marshall Mesa. Travis, tr Travis, time, Travis uh, your three minutes are up. Can you conclude your comments, please? I, I will, and I appreciate that opportunity. Um, they, this, they need to do proper excavation because underneath the ground there, they may find some terrible discoveries. So more than a Geiger counter will be necessary. You'll need to do some LIDAR examination. Excavate before you do anything. Thank you, Lynn. Lynn is really doing more work than she can fit into three minutes. Thank, Thank you, you Travis. Thank you. And uh, if you'd like to speak, this is the time to raise your hand. And I'm not seeing any other hands. That concludes the uh, public comment portion of the agenda. Dan, is uh, are there any responses that you'd like to make? Sure, thank you, Dave. Uh, yeah, just to uh, thank everybody who provided comments tonight, just a few quick uh, responses. Uh, one to Lauren Clark um, uh, regarding the dogs. Um, I understand your frustration. Uh, we have heard from the community uh, a, a few times through uh, reports into the city that uh, we need to uh, uh, be watching things out of Dry Creek a little bit more so the rangers um, are uh, uh, going to be doing some more active intentional uh, patrol out there. Our education and outreach team is also putting that on the agenda to be able to hit Dry Creek uh, more heavily uh, over the coming months. So I think that's gonna help matters. I would say that uh, the term no enforcement ever happens. Uh, uh, just, just a reminder to the board that in uh, just from our Rangers alone, this is not education and outreach trying to do educational type of, uh, but we, uh, we had over 1,000 either uh, verbal, uh, formal verbal warnings or summonses that were uh, that were issued in 2023. Well over half of them, uh, roughly around 600, uh, were dog related, either lack of a, a voice and sight tag, or dogs running um, uh, out uh, out of their uh, 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 control of the um, of the owner. So uh, by far, well over half. And uh, in any given year is always dog related in terms of formal enforcement activities. But uh, we are aware of that situation out of Dry Creek and hopefully we could uh, address that through some enhanced uh, patrol and staffing by our education outreach team. 
Uh, regarding Joyce's comment, yes, uh, uh, the city has been uh, referred uh, uh, that project to make comments on. Open space staff is involved in assembling comments from the open space perspective about any, uh, any concerns that we would see uh, with that potential facility in regards to open space values that are out there. So we're active in putting together comments uh, that represents the open space department. So those are the reactions or responses that I have. Thank you. Great, thanks, Dan. Um, on the uh, referral response from the county, the referral from the county and our response, um, can the board uh, can can the board get a copy of our response when it's uh, submitted? Yeah, um, we sort of. Uh, I, I'm, I'm really high profile high profile ones that we have. Uh, the last one that we provided you a copy of ours was with regards to the rifle club, if you remember, and we were planning to do the same thing. Great. Thanks. Uh, are there any comments uh, from the board or questions on the comments? Okay. Um, David, this one we have to make up. That, uh, that's next. Right. Um, so we'll go to matters from the board. Um, the first item is any comments we have on the uh, written material that was attached to the agenda. And so I'll, I'll run down those real quickly. And if you have comments, um, please make them. Uh, any comments on the North Foothills uh, Habitat Conservation Area implementation? Uh, just one comment is that it mentioned that there's gonna be no off-trail travel on that HCA except for areas west and north of Judd Ranch and inside the plan Mahogany Loop. And I. I don't know, is there a map of that somewhere? It wasn't in the packet. I'm just curious to know. There, there is a map in but, the packet. But it does not include that the where there would be off on and off travel, on and off trail travel permitted. Sure, we can we can yeah. provide just that. Just curious, because yep. yeah, I've used that space a, a bunch and there's social trails in various places. And I'm just wondering if there are use patterns that are gonna be impacted. I'm, I'm just like to see what what we anticipate that to look like. Right. I would imagine that's uh, in conjunction where, where the HCA boundaries and uh, end and begin, but we will provide a, a map to the trustees. Great. Uh, any other comments or questions on that? Um, I'm just going to once again say uh, I, I'm, I'm glad we're moving ahead on this and uh, it looks like this spring we can get this in front of council. Um, I think it's a very important uh, area uh, for a number of reasons in, in conjunction with the uh, dedication of the North Sky Trail. If we can uh, get approval of the HCA designation, that'd be great. So thanks for keeping that uh, in the forefront. Uh, the next one is the update on the city tribal memorandum of understanding. Are there any comments or questions on that? Uh, I, I have uh, one question and one request. Um, the request is on the, uh, the narrative on collecting uh, where the, the process is to be um, determined in the future. Um, I very strongly recommend that uh, we carefully design that uh, process and um, the, the concern I have, uh, which is also going to be in my next uh, comment, is that if we permit collecting for a group of people uh, and not for others, um, I, that just is a concern of mine. And I think we need to be cognizant of, of that. So designing that process, I think, will be uh, uh, very critical. And... So my comment is on the HCA, the, uh, the HCA uh, comments in the, in the memorandum of understanding, which said that uh, the, the, um, the tribes or, or tribal members can uh, exercise pedestrian access anywhere on the system. And so going back to the HCAs, um, I'm just wondering um, why we wouldn't want 
uh, to permit that kind of access in, in those areas. So uh, I know this uh, MOU is far down the line, but that's a concern of mine that once again, where we appear to be giving a group um, you know, special privileges when uh, others are equally desirous of, of those privileges. So um, I'm hoping that we can be uh, very careful in our design of, um, of that situation as well. Thanks, Dave. I, I believe uh, uh, just a, a 30 second response to that. So this updated memorandum of understanding incorporates uh, about four previous uh, memorandums of understanding, whether they were um, uh, 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 from 1999 to 2004, that was a specific provision that was in previous ones. So that's been with us now for about 20 years. But uh, yeah, your comment about limited harvesting, some other words, the reason that the language is the way it is, is because we would need to sort of work out how actually that would be done. Uh, we're committed to having that conversation. Uh, we told the tribes that we understand that's important to them and we're committed to it, but we, uh, you know, further conversation needs to happen on how that could be done and, and within city ordinance and all of that. So great. And the HCA. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy to add that to the, the question about, per, uh, collection and right. fire on our system and some other right. things that, yeah. The because those uh, MOU, those previous MOUs predated actually the development and designation of HCA, so um, that really wasn't in the conversation on the earlier MOUs. So, thank you um, for that. Any other comments or questions on that? Okay. Um, the US 36 North Foothills Highway Bikeway Feasibility Study any comments or questions on that? That looks awesome. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, I know the feasibility study is going to potentially be done like middle of this year. Can you like, you know, stick a, a finger in the wind and, and give any indication of when construction and completion on such a project might be might happen. I think sometimes the public, I mean, the North Sky Trail is an example. I, yeah. I feel like at every meeting I talk about how it was worth the wait. And yet sometimes the public can get excited about a resource. And I just think it's important that we're realistic about how long this might take. Yeah. And perhaps we could come back with a, uh, uh, obviously Boulder County is the lead here. Uh, we are scheduled to come back to the board, I believe in April. Uh, in May uh, to talk more specifically. So I do what I do know in terms of timelines is a two-step process. This first plan is just, is this even feasible? Uh, what kind of alignment may be feasible? And then after, the, uh, if you know it comes back and said, yep, there's an alignment that is feasible, then it sort of goes into that more traditional uh, analysis and, and working out the details of that, of, of that conceptual alignment, which is a whole second process to it. Uh, then after that, you know, would become sort of working on, well, when could it be built in for construction? What's that look like? But uh, perhaps by May, uh, we could work with Boulder County to see if, uh, if, if they're able to sort of narrow down a timeline in any way. Because I, I think the anticipation and uh, once this starts to get more public is, is going to be quite high. So yeah, I agree. but in other words, you're, we're, we're getting ready to get ready still. Yeah, I mean, I, I think if the results of the feasibility study come back uh, uh, later this spring and said, yeah, it's feasible out there, then, yeah, then I think uh, having a little bit higher of, it, uh, of a, an awareness of what the timeline might be is going to be super okay, helpful. Thanks. So uh, we'll see if we can build some of that in, if the county partners could help us with that uh, when we come back Thank in you. May. Thanks. You good on US 36 bikeway? I just want to make yeah I just want to make the comment that th this is re really important for our community. It's super dangerous out there. It meets all of our climate goals. Um, so I'm I'm really looking forward to getting some traction on this project. Great. In this Thanks decade or so. for those. Um, and then the last one is the Marshall Mine Coal Seam Mitigation and Marshall Mesa Improvement Project. Are there any questions or comments on that? Uh, Armin? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, Dave. Um, you know, I, I'm not a uh, geomorphologist, but, you know, when I read the piece about digging down 30 feet, um, you know, pulling up 
the the coal, which I'm assuming a lot of that is in its sort of you know natural state, even if it's hot, and then taking it up and cooling it, and mixing it, and then putting it all back in, you know, it just makes me wonder: is, is that you know state of the art practice? Um, you know, if you take consolidated rock in its natural you know geomorphological state, and then you pull it out and gush it up and stuff like that and then you stuff it back in then what happens when groundwater percolates through it you know after it's been chewed up and mixed with other things and i just wanted to ask if if anybody you know knows have have we you know found out is is what bureau of mine reclamation and safety is proposing to do um is is it safe is it okay mm -hmm. i think that's an excellent question and dan uh are we getting, is the board getting a presentation from the state? Yeah, we'll be back in April to talk about more details. Uh, uh, right now, we you know we have that high level request that came in January from DRMS is uh, about uh, what they would propose for uh, mitigation. And what uh, we're planning to do is to come back to you all in April with more details and more details of a timeline, more details of how that then would fit with our trailhead improvement plan uh sequencing them uh permitting that type of thing so i will add that question uh to the experts and uh we can maybe address some of that in when we come back in april thank you uh, brady was my reading of it right that we could be moving dirt relatively soon on that dan in 2024 uh, yeah, it's that, quite that's possible real, that's real soon and that would have presumably a big impact on everybody who uses that trailhead would it be closed for the duration yeah i mean like i said the more detail what we need in more details is we can come back to you with what, what the timeline would be from when they start construction to the end what what are we looking at as far as timeline uh then the proposal is is we're going to use that opportunity to go and when we put things back um we're going to put a new trailhead back and then what's that timeline right so there definitely would be a pretty significant closure uh, and, uh, in April, we can give you a little bit more detail on what that looks like. And we could certainly keep you updated throughout the summer and fall, uh, as we start to learn more about, uh, timing and, and what it looks like, but yeah, there'll be a, there'll be a significant impact in terms of, uh, people that enjoy that area, how, you know, how they are typically accessing yeah. this area now. And last question, what's the urgency on the mitigation? How dangerous is 80 degree coal? It, you know, when you read it, is it cold, it's 80 degrees, it seems benign, but like, can you paint a picture for how urgent this mitigation project? Yeah, again, I think that's a great question for DRMS to help address with you all. What our understanding is, is that, uh, uh, that the risk isn't something that they need to be out there tomorrow, but there's a combination of things as one, it's been an ongoing uh, issue out there for many, many years. One, I believe there's some available funding to address some of these sites throughout the state, including this one. And so I think it's a combination of, of we now have all the information we need in terms of how would we go about to mitigate it. There's available funding and let's just take care of it one, uh, uh, once and for all. Uh, so I think it's really a combination. It's, it's, I, 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 my opinion and reading everything right now is it's, it's, it's not like the risk is so high, but we better be out there tomorrow or else. It's it's kind of a combination of things that are happening. Thanks for those. Those are good questions. Um, and Dan, I think also in the in the update briefing for the board, if we could uh, get information on where public access will occur and kind of what areas are going to be specifically closed, and kind of how that all is going to work uh, during uh, the project, uh, both the uh, mitigation project and the trailhead construction uh, that would be really helpful so that people know where they need to go to get on whatever it is they can they can use yep that's great oh uh, and i have one question i'm looking at you jeff but uh, dan um so there there was a question of uh subsurface or mineral ownership do we know who owns the minerals uh, out there and kind of what the status of that ownership looks like? Yeah, there's a primary owner. Yep. And so can we, can the board uh, at least, uh, can you let the board know kind of what the status of the, it appears to be what the status of the mineral situation is there so that 
if there's any development potential, uh, oh, sure. we would know that or consider that. Yeah, I think the bottom line for these trustees is the city does not own the mineral rights right. out in that area. Right. So. Great. Uh, thanks. So that will conclude uh, the written material and our questions and comments. Uh, the other item on the agenda for the board is the um, written response to the city council's request for uh, priorities. And Dan, um, before we discuss that, can you uh, summarize real quickly again, uh, kind of your sense of what that request is and um, kind of the time frame that we're expecting to be in to respond uh for for what uh, issue did for the uh, council request for the priorities oh oh yeah um i believe the deadline i think we have it scheduled out that if you all put it in by your dis, uh, march meeting that That's that right. is going to be i i planned it out so you all could have that conversation in march give your thumbs up and then submit it and that will meet the deadline Okay. Uh, council's retreat is the uh, first week of April. Okay. And uh, I have asked uh, or polled the board members on their willingness to serve on a subcommittee to draft mm -hmm. uh, the board's response. Um, is there a written, is there anything written from the council that we could, they could use as far as uh, what the formal council request actually is or the little request was a two sentences that went out to directors <laughs> and i pretty much paraphrased what the request was okay. so unfortunately there is no template uh to provide it that's why uh, we did provide you with a couple of uh examples of what the board's done in the past um i think the one that's probably most relevant to this request would have been the earlier one that uh, i believe kurt Brown was chair of, of which it, that straightforward question is what's what's on your mind, OSBT? Uh, what are your top priority issues uh, that you feel are out there that you would like to convey to council? So uh, I, I, I think every board and commission probably approaches it a little differently. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. The 2019 uh, response, board response to council request was a the request was a multi-question uh, request. Um, so that was a little lengthier, I think, than what's anticipated uh, for this response. But basically it's one of the two, two or three, you know, key priorities that uh, this board sees, um, you know, focused on or a focus on for the coming year and kind of what that means and what it means as far as probably council's uh, consideration or participation. And the deadline is March 13th? Uh, that's when we, I think if we can uh, look at the draft as a full board, uh, we can approve uh, whatever it is we approve. And then that will go to council shortly thereafter. So the Ides of March will probably uh, weigh heavily on uh, that response. So, um, so I guess I'll just move real quickly. Um, both Brady and Harmon have uh, acknowledged that they'd be willing to serve on this uh, subcommittee to draft that. Um, would that be satisfactory to both of you to do that? Sure. Um, yeah, I just disclosed to Harmon that I'm going to be out of the country for a significant portion of the time, but we'll fit it in. Okay. Yeah. Great. And uh, Michelle probably can, in your absence, may be able to weigh in to, to help if that's necessary. So, great. Well, then, uh, uh, Harmon and Brady, uh, if uh, you're willing to serve on the subcommittee to draft the council response to council, um, if we can have that draft ready to consider for the March 13th board meeting, uh, that would be great. Ideally, if it's part of the normal packet submission, which oh, would be right. the Wednesday before, that's that is sort of a business practice. Uh, we have certainly had situations where we have at after the board packet, we put additional information out to the board. So if for some reason that deadline, you know, is hard for you to meet to put something out to your colleagues, uh, we, we can we can even do it, you know, after that, uh, that sort of informal deadline. So tentatively, maybe we shoot for March 5th, um, which would then, um, it would be incorporated in the board packet. Uh, 
yes. the March 13th meeting. So the, the only thing I'm I'm concerned about is, you know, let, yeah, I'm on. Let's say, uh, you know, Brady and I come up with three priorities and they're totally antithetical to what you and Michelle want. Um, you know, I, I think that would make for a hard discussion on March 13th. So is there some way we might uh, share what other board members' priorities are before <laughs> Brady and I start putting pen to paper? I would maybe like to make a suggestion. Um, the way we kind of set the um, agenda for our retreat, I think we could kind of copy that. Mm -hmm. People mm -hmm. submit to right. Dan their ideas, and then you can um, you can crowdsource that and then distill it down. So like give us a deadline that everybody gives gives Dan some ideas. And then, and because I, I think, you know, you could um, data mine the ideas that came out of our retreat. Mm -hmm. That's a good place to start. Or, you know, we could just give you some some ideas. Okay. Yeah, I think Leah and, and I would be happy to kind of be a, a go between for indiv if individuals want to kind of throw here are my three. I would also suggest to try to theme them out rather than getting real yeah. real specific. Yeah, yeah. Um, that might be helpful as well. But yeah, we could help, uh, you know, make sure that Brady and Harmon get individual ideas. Uh, okay, if we could get those by the 28th. So two yeah, weeks. I was going to say maybe in a, you know, How about just a week. I mean, okay, he's going to. Uh, well, by the end of the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> by the end of the meeting. No, I mean, could, okay. could yes. you and Michelle, and yes. if, if John's available, right. just, you know, let Dan know or, uh, by the end of the week. And I think the week. other uh, thing it, if you can consult the uh, the retreat minutes, mm -hmm. yes. as far as uh, kind of the, some of the items that we discussed, mm -hmm. uh, would probably be helpful as well. Okay, thank you. Great. So uh, we'll look to the twenty eighth to get initial comments no, I think to Harmon, right? How about the twenty first? Oh, because okay. all you have to do is say what what your top three things are. Right. Okay. Twenty first, and, and get them to you know if you can get them to Dan then. Brady and I'll have a little bit more time. Right. Yeah. We have great confidence in both of you. And so we'll uh, provide the grist for that mill. Thank you. Yeah. And any support, um, I'm happy to be there. Okay. Okay. And thanks <clears throat> very much for your willingness to do that, both of you. Sure. So I th uh, any other uh, items from board members under matters? Seeing and hearing none. Uh, I think we will go to our item for public hearing. Dan? All right. Um, Bethany is here. Okay, good. Um, she's back. <laughs> <laughs> she sneaked in undercover. <laughs> oh, third time's a charm, folks. Third time is a charm. Uh, while she's making her way up here, I, I don't think this needs much of an introduction other than I, this is... Uh, an issue we brought forward. Uh, this is our third time and a, a slightly different iteration again from the previous two. Uh, the spirit of this one was realizing that there could be multiple requests from separate um, utility type entities. And we, uh, as an open space, uh, we realized the complexity of what would that look like if over the next year? We had three separate requests and three separate lines and, and the impacts to that. And, and the idea of how about co-locating everything, folks, and encouraging them to do that. And this is a result of that urging. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to turn things over to uh, Bethany Collins. Good evening, trustees. Good evening. Uh, I promised to make this short. I know I was asked, so, you know, uh, there was begged <laughs> last time to make it short. And I mean, Dan presented a whole lot of it. So <laughs> Good to go. Um, we're here tonight to talk about a request from Excel Energy and on behalf of uh, several telecommunication providers for approval and recommendation to city council to use portions of open space in the areas of, in the area of Chautauqua Park to install and maintain subsurface utilities. We'll have this short presentation and then time for questions. Next slide, please. I realize you might feel like this is the hundredth time you've seen a version of this memo and presentation. Uh, so let me give a quick overview of the request and how this project work varies ever so slightly from what you've already seen. 
uh, previous consideration related to utility undergrounding at this site was for the city's broadband fiber connect connectivity only with approval first given to installation via boring and then via trenching. One of the proposed alignments ran within Bluebell Road and Enchanted Mesa and as well as Enchanted Mesa Road. And the approved amendment allowed for possible installation of additional conduits subject to necessary agreements. So fast forward to now, uh, and that's where we are. After extensive project review, oh, excuse me, excuse, <laughs> next slide, please. Um, after extensive project review and collaboration between utility providers, the Colorado Chautauqua Association, also called CCA, um, and city staff in OSMP, climate initiatives, utilities, and IT, <laughs> this request is for approval of the use of portions of the Batchelder open space for the installation and maintenance of subsurface electrical, telecommunication, and broadband utilities installed as one project. Approval of this request would replace the previously approved broadband alignment in Enchanted Mesa Road. Next slide, please. Rather than being located entirely within Enchanted Mesa Road, the Eastern alignment to connect the water tank and radio tower is now proposed to extend from the neighborhood to the east and connect to existing utilities serving that area. While the initial construction will have more surface disturbance than previously approved alignment within in Enchanted Mesa Road, the route is shorter and OSMP program staff have not expressed concern with the alignment or identified any sensitive or rare resources in that corridor. This alignment may also be able to take advantage of existing utility easements on the private properties to some degree. The Western alignment lies just east of Bluebell Road under the existing overhead utility corridor and overlapping with the CCA leasehold. This provides connectivity to the Ranger Cottage and the Chautauqua community. The diagram here, <laughs> very busy, uh, reflects the general alignments through the property which already have existing utility, trail, fencing, and other infrastructure. For those located on OSMP managed lands, the alignments are expected to be minimally refined or adjusted in the field and based on actual topographic geotech and resource conditions and to avoid other utilities. The utility corridor will be 10 feet wide and except for where utility cabinets are needed, which could require a 10 or 20 by 20 area. Disturbance to OSMP land is anticipated to be around one acre and the utility installation, restoration and ongoing access for maintenance and repair needs will be governed by applicable utility agreements and include reversionary terms if the corridors are not used for utilities or abandoned. Next slide, please. You're gonna see a lot, I mean, you see a lot of pictures of utility lines for, for dramatic effect, I suppose. Uh, this project also includes removal of the existing overhead infrastructure, which over time has become a web of utility lines that greatly impacts the scenic viewshed and visitor experience in and around Chautauqua Park. Next slide. All or a vast majority of the installation within the open space will be via trenching to allow visualization of other subsurface utilities and installation where topographic geotech and curved alignment limitations exi uh, exist. The joint trenching in one construction project enables coordination of impacts and restoration and closures and detours. The utility stakeholders can also opt to install additional empty conduits to allow for future utility installation or upgrades. Next slide, please. Benefits to open space land or OSMB land and programs, as well as the greater city and public of this upgraded and undergrounded utility infrastructure, including increased electrical reliability, broadband connectivity to important city infrastructure and eventually the Chautauqua community fire risk mitigation, and improvements of the aesthetics of the campus and scenic viewshed. Additionally, the joint trench or one project approach is favored by city staff to limit ground disturbance, user impact and trail access, uh, trail and access closures, and promote sharing of construction and restoration costs. Next slide, please. So as I wrap up, I'll remind you all about the process in place for considering this work. Uh, interest in open space land may not be conveyed or transferred such as for utility easements and installation of public utility infrastructure without first complying with the disposal provisions of Article 12, Section 177 of our city charter, which requires OSBT approval and recommendation to city council. 
Next slide. So that brings us to the staff recommendation and questions from the board. Thank you, Bethany. Um, are there any questions from the board? Brady? Bethany, thank you for the very succinct uh, presentation. <laughs> I appreciated the, the pictures, the overhead lines, because they bother me. So that's really nice. Will this have any impact on any existing hiking trails? It looks like the alignment overlaps a bit. Is there going to have any, will, that, will there be any impact on the land? Yeah, or? during construction, Bluebell Road is anticipated to have detours, to be closed and have detours. And we are working on the timing for that. It may be in the off season to at least mitigate some of the, <laughs> the seasonal impacts, um, but there will be detours or uh, intermittent closures for, for uh, vehicular access. Uh, the majority, except for the pinch point, kind of right at the, the south end of Chautauqua, um, can, it, for the most part, can be um, avoided by, by all the equipment being off the trail. Um, Enchanted Mesa Trail also will be, um, uh, it will not be closed as anticipated to be that the, the, the access, there may be equipment on the trail, but the trail users will be able to, to, to get, uh, to, to get where they need to go. We have made clear to these utility providers, the need for not just trail user, but emergency access on those routes, because those are important emergency access, um, corridors. Michelle. Hi, Bethany. Hey, Michelle. Um, I realize that our scope in this project is pretty narrow, but um, you know, I'm just curious if you, um, you can tell us like, um, who was paying for all this undergrounding. I used to sit on the, the Chautauqua board, so I know that's something that those residents have wanted for a really long time. And so I'm just wondering if Excel's paying for part of it, is the association paying for part of it? Yes, <laughs> uh, a great a, a, a great deal of it is out of what's called the one percent funds for the city for the city in Excel, um, and so that came out of I believe the franchise agreement and and other things, um, but it is it is a combined effort of of uh, of the one percent funds that um, Excel holds again through the city fan franchise and as well as CCA is investing a lot, especially where I mean for the majority it's where it is in the campus they are paying. Yes, yep. It is not any open space funds and it is not city utility funds. No. Thanks. City broadband will be paying a portion for, for their installation. Yes. Believe it or not, Bethany, I have three questions. One. Uh, <laughs> first of all, um, with the easement, does the open space and mountain parks department still maintain surface management? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So um, the if the easements or utility agreements will um, only convey the rights for those underground for and and access for maintenance, repair, things like that. Um, what we do on the surface will not be able to operationally conflict. That's usually where utility, you know, where where utilities um, uh, get some exclusivity, but exclusivity. But because they are underground, um, we have sole uh, rights on the on the. Um, okay, thanks for that. And the mitigation uh, that will occur will be based on our requirements. And Absolutely, we Always. will monitor it. Yes, yes. All of our uh, utility agreements, easements, temporary agreements, construction agreements, things like that absolutely have restoration requirements, including revegetation. They have warranty periods. They also have weed control that also have associated uh, warranty periods. Great. So all that will go in the agreement. Definitely. Yep. Great. And I should probably know this, but where is the emergency radio tower? Um, it may actually be in one of my pictures. Let's see. Um, uh, Leah, can you go back to slide number seven? So back two slides. It is right next to the water, the water, That's the enchanted the, water. Tank. Yeah. The, yeah. The reservoir. So we're not proposing uh, any additional installation no issues associated with it nope not at all so if you can see in that right, no, in that I, picture yeah. on the right it is just uh south of the enchanted mesa water tank and okay. it is um it's been there for decades i right. believe yeah. so yes and so it it stays and it operates right? yes yes okay. it is very important to our rangers and to our other right. first responders yes. great uh, any other questions or comments Great, thank you very much. Uh, we'll return it to the board for a motion. Uh, a public, public hearing. Public oh, the, how about a public <laughs> hearing? <laughs> uh, 
Uh, there are any members of the public that would like to speak, Sam? Uh, so first... okay, there we go. Um, so first we'll start with in-person. So just a reminder, if you haven't signed up already to sign up on the sheet of paper, if you would like to speak online, uh, just raise your hand. You can either press the raise hand icon at the bottom of your screen, or you'll see the participants icon, three dots on the bottom right, and then you can click uh, raise hand. So I'm just gonna check to see if we have anyone signed up in person. And we do have one person signed up in person. So uh, Lynn Siegel, if you could come to the podium and we'll work on, we're just gonna get the timer up and running. So if we'll just give us a moment. Okay, you're all set. I support this project, but I don't support Excel Energy. It's the second worst thing besides CU in Boulder. Rates soaring. You know, people like me, 3,000 more in property tax per year, and Excel needs to go. They aren't meeting their goals, I hear just lately. And it doesn't matter. We can drop Excel at any time, any time. We don't have to meet their metrics. We can do it whenever we want. I worked for 10 years on that. We need to unload Excel yesterday. Definitely do that. But this project, yeah, meantime, we're stuck with them. We should have gotten rid of them before. And um, now it's just continued problems of a major, huge utility and no chances of the really progressive things like reactive energy and um, distributive generation over transmission generation, which they're always going to push. And, and oh, we're, we're really green, greenwash transmission. And um, we need to do it the right way. And Excel will never do it. They have the wrong business model. They're, you know, shareholder, not stakeholder. And so, I hate to say, yeah, yes for this thing about undergrounding, but a big, huge no on Excel Energy. And please tell all your friends and all the other boards and the council to unload Excel yesterday. Thank you, Lynn. Okay, if you'd like to sign up to, or if you'd like to speak online, if you could just raise your hand. Okay, I'm seeing one hand from Travis Hugh Coley. Travis, you should be able to unmute yourself now. I, 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 I know that I spoke to this in my previous comment. I, um, I'm gonna take this opportunity just to replace my statement for um, your minutes so that um, no one can say that um, the public comment wasn't, uh, or this hearing didn't consider the radioactivity of Marshall Mesa and Marshall Lake. Um, we need to look at that area like it's a hazmat scene. And, you know, this is what I really concur with many of the things that Lynn brings up about Boulder having a bit of an image problem. You know, the, Bol the Boulder bubble, we call it. This is a general comment. Maybe it fits in the earlier part of our meeting. When we think about the radioactivity of our region and we, and we, and we, and we think about how it can cause, we've actually bracketed the conversation to be around cancer. But before we bracket, before we put the parameters around it, the real concern is combustion when it comes to toxic waste. Thank you so much. Thank you, Travis. Sam, are there any other people to comment? Okay, so just uh, if you do want to raise your hand to speak, now is the time and I'm not seeing any other hands. Well, now is the time I will close the public hearing and bring it back to the board. Uh, are there any further comments or questions? Just to, you know, set the record straight um, on Travis's last comment, uh, he was talking about Marshall Mesa, which is five miles away from Enchanted Mesa. These, there's, there's no, I, I don't, think we have any issue with radioactivity at Chautauqua. So I just want to make that clear to anyone else who's listening. 
Great, thanks for the clarification, Harmon. Uh, seeing no other comments, um, I will certainly entertain a motion. Sure. Uh, Harmon. Okay. Um, I move to approve and recommend that city council approve the use of the batch elder open space property lands by the public service company of Colorado DBA Excel energy. And on behalf of Comcast Xfinity CenturyLink Lumen and the city of Boulder innovation and technology department to install and maintain subsurface electric and telecommunication utilities via open trenching or boring in the general alignments depicted on attachment A pursuant to the disposal procedures of article 12, section 177 of the city of Boulder charter. Thank you for that. Are there any further comments? Uh, is there a second? I'll second. I will do a roll call. Uh, Harmon? Yes. Uh, Michelle? Yes. Brady? Yes. And I vote yes as well, so it passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bethany. Until next time. Try not to come back. <laughs> see you next month. Yeah, yeah. We, we hope you, no, we never you see you again. You That's true. Yeah, actually, you will. <laughs> uh, so, Dan, I think uh, this ball is now in your court completely. Yeah, we're going to do something we haven't done yet, which is transition Sam away from supporting the meeting itself to being a lead presenter. So she's gonna walk across the hall here and, and get uh, set up to help us kick off the first matters from the department. We have two tonight. And this is just to kind of wet your whistle to give you a little bit of an overview of an upcoming fee study that uh, we're going to be doing. We, we daylighted this idea to you last year. It is coming to fruition uh, in terms of commencement. And so Sam is just going to uh, give you a brief presentation on what's in store and what's next. So, thank you. I'm just going to get the presentation up here. Okay, there we go. Okay, good evening again, trustees. I'm Sam McQueen, the Business Services Senior Manager for OSMP, and I'll be sharing information about an upcoming comprehensive review of fees charged by the department. We have a short presentation for you tonight to discuss the topic. We'll start with an overview of those fees charged by OSMP. Then we'll review the contents and timeline of a request for proposal. And we'll leave time for questions and discussion at the end. So I'll start by defining a fee. Our city attorney's office provided an analysis of taxes versus fees that was included in the packet this month. Generally, fees are imposed for the purchase of covering the cost of a specific program. And revenue generation for the department beyond cost recovery may be considered a tax, which requires voter approval. We previously presented cost recovery analyses performed by OSMP staff to the OSBT as part of annual revenue updates, most recently in March 2023. Also to note, most OM OSMP fees are codified, which means they're included in the Boulder Revised Code. Any changes to codified fees would need council review and approval through an ordinance. I'll go through programs that charge fees in the next few slides and we'll highlight the major fees charged by the programs. Just to note that some administrative and optional fees are left out of this presentation, but will be included in the upcoming comprehensive fee review. So first, OSMP charges fees under the Voice and Sight tag program, which allows for guardians to hike with their dogs off leash on certain designated trails. These fees are codified. We also charge fees for parking at certain trailheads for cars not registered in Boulder County and fees to obtain permits for certain commercial activities on the system. All fees listed here are codified except for the annual woodlot permit, which is set by the department. The final category of fees is our facility rental program, which allows for reservations at the sites listed here. Fees for facility reservations are not codified and are set by the department. At the March 2023 OSBT meeting, staff noted CAO's recommendation to perform a holistic fee review to determine if OSMP fees are appropriately recovering costs. We'll be seeking a consultant to perform this work in 2024 and have posted an RFP with the goal of receiving a report that covers the following topics. Determine the cost to provide services that currently charge a fee. Determine if the current fees are sufficient for providing associated services 
and recommend changes to fees to recover costs if applicable. And a copy of the draft RFP is included in this month's packet. And then here's a high level timeline of the comprehensive fee review process. The RFP is posted now in February. Proposals are due in March and OSMP staff will select a consultant to perform the review shortly after that. The final comprehensive fee review will be done in July. If fee changes are recommended, OSMP staff will review those internally and will bring updates to the OSBT. And fee changes won't be incorporated into the 2024 or 2025 budgets. If needed, OSMP staff would come back to the OSBT with recommended fee changes as part of future budgets. So closing out with questions and discussion now, um, does the OSBT have any questions about the posted RFP and its contents? And what information would the OSBT like to review throughout the fee study process? Thank you, Sam. Uh, do the board members have any questions or comments? Brady? Thanks. Thanks for the um, presentation, Sam. Appreciate it. Two questions. One is, um, <clears throat> what led staff to decide that, to outsource this to a consultant as opposed to taking it on in-house? I mean, I read the RFP. There was a lot of work that went into the RFP and then vetting and selecting and then paying for them. It just seems like a lot. And so I'm just curious to know, obviously that ship has sailed, but I'm just curious to know what the thought process was behind that. And then number two, I didn't see, it, it seemed to me that the focus was explicitly on cost recovery, very much an inward looking process. There was no mention of the impacts that fees would have on residents in the materials that I read. There was no mention of the equity or regressive nature of some of those fees. There was no mention, mention of behavior. It was interesting. The first person who, who spoke to us tonight was talking about uh, voice and sight. And I have to imagine if we're looking for compliance, especially from people who don't live here, charging them 75 bucks as opposed to the 13 that we charge residents probably has a, has a negative behavioral impact on what we're looking to see on the land which may or may not be related to the cost recovery side of the equation. So I guess my second question is the extent to which this study is gonna look only at cost recovery or also look at behavior and equity impacts on our users and residents. Yeah, um, so I will address the first part of your question, um, which was related to, uh, and I'm sorry, I didn't jot that down. Could you, do you mind? Why, why we what? outsourced it? Uh, thank you, time. outsourcing. Sorry about that. I had that as my second one in my head. Um, so the outsourcing uh, was a decision after years of performing it in-house. We typically do that on a case-by-case -case basis with each of our programs. And then we present all of our findings to you as part of that annual revenue update. In consultation with our city attorney's office, I think we wanted to take a more holistic look. We also know that we leave things out uh, for our cost recovery analysis, like enforcement. We don't consider that in our cost recovery process, uh, our cost recovery analyses internally, just in terms of capacity to to calculate that kind of information. Um, and so I think we're seeking a consultant support to figure out how do we go about doing that? Can we figure out those enforcement hours? What would you recommend for that? So I think that's gonna be a huge piece of it. Um, and then uh, I think we just want a more holistic view of every dollar that gets spent in these programs where we just wanna make sure that we've considered all of those dollars. It's been a very long time since we've done this type of holistic fee review. And so we, want to make sure our um, our process internally is right in future years. Um, and again, it's sort of been done, these updates have happened sort of piecemeal in the past, and it would be nice to have that more holistic view. Um, so determine that an outside consultant would be able to help best with that. Um, and then the second piece of your question, you're right, this is very much focused on cost recovery. Uh, we because we haven't done a, a comprehensive fee review in a while, uh, I think we have a, a real need to figure out if we're recovering costs first. And then what you're explaining is, um, I think something that we we as a department, I, Dan, you may wanna address this as well. Um, we as a department would wanna address, but not necessarily as part of this first fee review process. Um, you, you'll probably note, it was a very small sign uh, in, one of our, in one of the slides. We do consider um, 
uh, reduced fees for uh, residents and non-residents who meet certain criteria, um, but that is not necessarily part of this fee review study. And so I think that would be something that happens separately from this. Yeah, just to add on that, that would, that would be, I guess, the follow-up to that. We're going to get the financial analysis. And then in terms of how we proceed with that information and going forward, I think that's a conversation in and of itself. This is going to be one piece, but the equity lens, the behavior lens, that would be all like, what do we do about this information? Um, uh, you know, if, if there's, if there's, if we're not recovering our costs, I, I, that doesn't mean we automatically then increase the fee. It's that's kind of where the conversation comes in because there's a lot of implications with that, that would rub up against our equity goals and, and, uh, and things. So, uh, this is a subject that over the years, the trustees have been interested in mm -hmm. having us bring forward. So I think some of the impetus was, uh, uh, past iterations of this board has expressed interest in. Are we recovering our fees out there? What we do with the information that we get back from the consultants is a whole second phase. And, and that's where more of the engagement between board and staff will take place. Armin? So if you, if you look at the packet, it, it, what I'm taking from this dialogue right now is that um, the numbers that we have, which show that all of the fee programs more than recover their cost, um, the issue is that we're, we're trying to get more granular on the cost side and, and, and test these numbers. Cause it's really easy to figure out the recovery side. It's the cost side. That's, you know, you know how much you collect in fees, but you, you're not so sure how much the department is really spending. And that's, that's where that's so that I agree. I think that's a, a great place to start. Um, but I, I think that that the equity and behavior stuff that Brady's talking about is uh, is super important too, because as I read the city attorney's memo and the the you know I didn't do my own research on the case law, but according to the city attorney, there isn't much in the way of exactitude that the courts demand. You know that it it, it can still be a fee if it is close enough to recovering costs. And if you go over a little bit, that's okay. And they don't define what a little bit is. So that gives the department a lot of leeway to set fees for, you know, purposes of creating equity, purposes of creating, you know, the environment for better behavior and stuff like that. So I would just, you know, invite you to, to you know, think about that holistically as you do this, as well as, as the, the cost and the recovery piece, which, I think is really an important first stage to know, you know, how do these numbers really look when we plug all of the, you know, pieces in. Uh, but once you know that, then, you know, it's nice that the courts have given us the leeway to, to set fees in such a way that, you know, we can try to balance equities and, and, and engender better behavior. Let me uh, piggyback on that, <clears throat> Sam because uh, and I'll get to you. Yeah. Um, it, when I was looking at this, a number of the, uh, the items, the, the recovery was substantially greater than uh, the apparent costs. And so I'm wondering, where does Tabor come in or how are we dealing with those um, fees that are generating you know, a substantial amount of revenue above, apparently above and beyond what our costs are. Yeah, I think a big piece of what you probably saw in the the most recent analysis that we did internally that we attached to the March 2023 analysis that was attached to this month's packet, um, enforcement hours are the, are the thing that we are not calculating right now. And we know that is a big chunk of this. Um, you saw in the draft RFP that we are asking for some advice on how to do that um, and how to figure out how to include enforcement hours, whether they should be included in cost recovery. Um, because in our recent analysis, at least the last three years, we've kind of just included it as an asterisk and said, we know that this is recovering costs and we know that you see that it's, it's a difference here and that difference is enforcement. Um, and so just trying to figure out how we should include enforcement and how we can calculate that. But some of that is pretty substantial. And so my question is, is the enforcement component actually the, subs the most substantive part of, uh, of some of those numbers? 
So we don't actually know. I think that's why we want to make sure that we're getting these numbers right through a, a with a consultant. Again, because we've done this internally the last few years and the last few updates to fees or reviews of fees have kind of been done piecemeal. I think that's exact that's exactly what we're hoping to get out of this type of report from a consultant um, to figure out are are we making sure that we're uh, accounting for all of our costs related to these programs? And then are we recovering costs? Are we you know, collecting more than it costs to run the program? Are we collecting less? And then would you recommend a fee adjustment because of that? So I can't necessarily say right now, but I'm, um, but we hope that that is an outcome of this type of report. Great. Michelle, you want to jump yeah. in? Um, <clears throat> I have a request that, you know, when we get uh, to the point where we are looking at the recovery side of things, um, can you do an analysis of what neighboring communities charge for things like um, the facility rentals. Um, and then the other question, the question that I have is, because I was looking at that timeline and, you know, the RFP is out, you know, they, they're just going to be like, in three months, there's going to be, you're going to choose who it is, and then they're going to perform their analysis and have a recommendation by July. It seems kind of quick. Um, I'm just wondering if in that process, can uh, the board have some visibility into their allocation methodologies and before they get all the way down to the end of the road where the, they have a recommendation, but we're not really, I mean, when you all did the, the, um, the analysis, we had some idea of your methodology. I don't know if what their methodology is going to be like. I know like um, when we did the nighttime um, parking permits for Flagstaff, those are free, um, but I don't, I don't, I don't know if that's included in this analysis, but like, how would you go about um, allocating the cost of the, the software that provides some free permits and then some permits that you actually have to pay for? So I think it just would be helpful to know, you know, how they're going about the, uh, the allocation process. Uh, another thing, uh... Sam, uh, kind of echoing what uh, Michelle said and Brady both have said is that it it strikes me that there that there ought to be even in this analysis and Dan I, I hear what you're saying as far as getting the financials um, you know kind of out there and understood but it strikes me that we really should have some public participation in in this and. And even the consultant, it strikes me, would benefit in their analytical element to get some, you know, public response to what they have found or their results. And so, I don't know, maybe pretty late in the game to kind of get that into the RFP, but I do think the department really should make a concerted effort to uh, ensure that the public uh, ha has a, a vital role in kind of the final outcome of, of this uh, of this project. Yeah, Brady. Um, great comments from the other board members. Thank you for that. I, I guess I've, I've uh, the question I have is, you know, is the driver here making sure that we don't run a, f a foul of Tabor or is the driver really trying to, to ensure that we're covering the cost of these programs. Um, these, even we throw all the fees together, it's a fraction of our overall budget. And so I have to imagine if we, an honest accounting of the time spent analyzing it may indicate that we've spent a huge portion of our fee recovery on the analysis itself. And so because this is a highly scrutinized and relatively small part of our budget, is it the case that if we just are very, if, if, if we get clarity that the fees that we're collecting are well under the cost of the program, is that adequate or that would solve the Tabor problem, it seems to me, or is it really that we're trying to figure out if there's parity between the program and the fee? I think it's a little of both. And I think we want to bring that to you as part of this, this next phase of the, the work. Um, we, of course, we want to make sure that we are, we're not running afoul of Tabor. Um, but we also want to make sure uh, we are charging the right fees for the, the work that's happening. You're, you're right. It is a small portion of our revenue 
Most of our revenue comes from sales and use taxes. This is just a small portion of it. Um, we are really just interested in making sure that we're not charging too much, too little. We're charging the right amounts for these programs and that they are, um, we're meeting the criteria set under Tabor. So just one more. Um, oh, thanks. Uh, you know, I've been really impressed with the way the department uses adaptive management. Um, and, and I think I'd just like to know if this is an opportunity for that too, if you're looking at it that way. Like for example, you know, let's say you find that there's a well-accepted fee and in, in a certain area, you're collecting a lot more than your actual um, cost recovery need is, but it's also an area that, you know, people are complaining about, like the dog tag program for, you know, sight and, and voice control. And so now, you know, now you can choose, do you want to lower the fee or do you want to put more resources into the cost side of the equation? You know, we've got this extra money we're, we're recovering and nobody's barking about the, you know, the cost of the tag. Um, let's just throw some more resources at it to balance the equation that way. Um, does, does that factor into the analysis at all? Yes. And I think, um, I, I think we also want to make sure too, that we're, you know, we, we don't know what the results will be of this mm -hmm. analysis. I think mm -hmm. it's going to tell us a lot as we're working with the consultant. And if we have those findings in the process between now and July, when we're asking for the report to be uh, finished, we may raise those types of things. And then I think after that analysis in July, we're, we're probably going to have those types of findings that we would want to talk to you mm -hmm. about. Um, but yes, I, I mean, your, your point of adaptive management is, is a great one. And I think that that's going to be a big piece of the next phase of this. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds like it's great to, uh, you know, I, I, I get it. We, we may be spending money on a consultant, but I think you're going to learn a lot and we're going to learn a lot and it'll be worthwhile. Uh, Sam, I have one other, thanks, Harold. Um, one other question that's tangential, and I don't know, Heather or Janelle may actually, I, I want to kind of get you ready for your next presentation, Heather. Um, um, so I have HCAs, uh, like a burr under my saddle tonight, um, but in the, uh, in the 2023 memo, HCA permits were included, um, even though there are no fees or you know no revenue attached to them. So I have two questions. One is, do we know where, I mean, theoretically we do know where those HCA permits are issued, uh, kind of what HCAs are, are getting, what level of off-trail use. And, and then the second one is, so how are we monitoring that? Um, and I know this isn't your, this isn't your um, area of uh, either expertise or responsibility, but given that it's, it's part of the permit system, um, it strikes me that we ought to be able to say somewhat definitively, okay, not only how many permits have we issued annually, but here's kind of where the, the concentrations are, here, here's where they are, and some notion of yeah, well, we've been out there and, you know, we're not seeing any impacts or we are seeing some and here's how we're adaptively managing that. So anyway, I would just urge that um, as one of, as we go through this process that we not forget there's some, uh, I think, vital information for some of these non-fee permit uh, programs and HCAs is one. Thank you. Okay, I'm just going to take another turn since everybody else went a second round. Um, I'm really interested in the allocation methodology as a numbers person myself. I want to be really transparent that we are like allocating clearly. We're not trying to make the numbers just sort of work out. Um, you know, like, oh, we could have we could allocate more enforcement. So we're allocating more for enforcement for parking. And then we're also doing the same for um you know, the, the voice and tag program that we're doing it in a way that's very transparent and it's also um, clear and consistent with how we're um, allocating in other programs because we're not trying to make money here. We're not trying to gouge 
um, residents who live outside of the city of Boulder. We're just really trying to do a really fair and clear analysis of what our costs are, but that's really gonna depend on the allocation methodology that they use. Yeah, we, we will certainly make sure that's included in anything we bring back to you as a... Uh, any further questions? Great. Thank you very much, Sam. Uh, we appreciate that and uh, we'll look forward to continuing conversations. Thanks, Sam. You can stay on this side if you want. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Our second and last uh, main topic for under matters from the board. Uh, I'm going to ask Tori Poulton to come up, who is going to provide us uh, with sort of a summary of our 2023 annual uh, meeting and our 2024 uh, look ahead and our management plans and around our uh, prairie dog management, as well as uh, conflict and our, with, between prairie dogs and irrigated agriculture. And Heather, you're joining us too. All right, good. Yeah. Everybody wants to get home and celebrate with their honeys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have other promises to keep. <laughs> Everybody, I'm Tori Fulton, the Fulton. Uh, so, like, run through summary of prairie dog conservation. Sounded like it was on. I can't tell. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I'm going to uh, quickly run through summary of prairie dog conservation and management in 23, plans for 24, and discuss the annual prairie dog meeting that we had in December. Um, so I think we don't need to go into quite a lot of basic prairie dog background since we've talked about this a lot over the last year, but to quickly summarize that um, guidance on OSMP lands for prairie dog management um, comes from the Grassland Ecosystem Management Plan of 2010. Um, also from recommendations that came from the Prairie Dog Working Group in 2018. And then the um, expedited review of conflicts between agriculture and prairie dog management, the process that happened during 2019 and 2020. And out of that came the pre preferred alternative recommended by the board and approved by council um, to use lethal control to remove prairie dogs where we have conflicts on irrigated agricultural lands in a specified Northern project area. Um, this also included restoration of irrigated agriculture and use of barriers to uh, minimize the number of prey dogs that could recol recolonize a removal area and uh, evaluation of coexistence options as well. And then our process through, that we went through last year to uh, modify some of our management um, methods um, for addressing this, this conflict between prey dogs and irrigated agriculture. Um, resulted in expanding the implementation area from that northern project area to using um, prey dog removals on irrigable agricultural land system-wide where the colonies are designated as transition or removal areas. It also expanded use of the burrow disturbance, um, increasing that uh, burrow disturbance depth to six inches or 12 inches with prior um, notification again, system-wide on irrigated agricultural lands and hiring staff and acquiring equipment to implement lethal control in-house. And that staff can also help with barrier maintenance and other program activities. <clears throat> 
few uh, planning modifications that came out of the process last year um, was evaluation of properties based on specific characteristics um, that would help uh, focus our removal plans and um, best opportunities for success. Um, this is evaluated each year. And then we continue to identify um, funding for water infrastructure improvements um, where we have on these conflict properties um, with irrigation. Then we had our annual public meeting to discuss prairie dog management. That was on December 11th, so about two months ago. And this is our opportunity to touch base once a year with the, with the public. We updated on prairie dog management and conservation in 23 and plans for 24. Um, presentations were made, uh, recorded and made available online by staff so that public could um, review those and have information going into the plan. And management topics included prairie dog, again, conservation and management, population monitoring, um, agricultural removal activities, and agricultural restoration. We took questions and provided answers during the meeting and also online after the meeting. And we made all the questions and comments available online and they're also included in the OSBT memo. Um, so if to summarize the 23 uh, prey dog management accomplishments, um, <laughs> again, we touched on review and approval of those modifications to our management plans um, to address prey dog conflict on irrigated agriculture. Um, again, we've been talking about adaptive management, and this is definitely a good example of that. Um, we implemented these new plans in 2020 and 2021. We had these three years to look at what worked and what didn't, and had this opportunity to make some modifications to try to be more efficient and effective. For uh, relocations, we trapped and translocated 484 prairie dogs from about 27 acres on the Axelson property. That's about Northwest of Boulder Reservoir. And those prey dogs were taken down to the Pueblo Chemical Depot in Pueblo, Colorado. Um, they have identified or had identified um, a imminent goal of receiving black-footed ferrets relocated to their property. And ferrets require a robust prey dog population. So the Chemical Depot is um, um, augmenting their prairie dog populations. And um, that was done um, quite successfully. I know they took, I think, several thousand over the in the last year or so. And they did have ferrets reintroduced to the site in uh, November and December of this last year. And it sounds like from a few meetings I've been at recently, those they can they've been able to see that the ferrets, at least some of them are, are doing well out there. So it's kind of exciting that our prairie dogs went to support ferret recovery too. Um, we also removed using lethal control on approximately 98 acres. And again, this is irrigated agricultural land. To minimize recolonization on these removal areas, over 17,000 feet of barrier was constructed at the relocation and um, removal sites. And this is a combination of chicken wire, um, we used some vinyl, and then a pretty extensive amount of metal barrier this last year. We use passive relocation on a few small conflict areas, um, less than one acre, and these are mostly in um, trail um, areas where they're doing trail repairs or um, resurfacing or renovation. Um, restoration work obviously was continuing in the last year and in the last between 2018 and 23, that brings up to 450 acres that have been um, restored or have work ongoing. We distributed two rounds of sylvatic plague vaccine in the southern grasslands. Um, plague, sylvatic plague is an ongoing problem for, and it's kind of a, a difficult to predict or control when it happens. So sylvatic plague has been identified as an effective way to maintain prairie dog populations on the landscape. It doesn't necessarily prevent entire um, or plague from happening at all, but it does help maintain prairie dogs on the landscape. Um, we kept working on the barrier cost share program. We talked about that a fair bit last year. I think we pretty much got the um, structure of the plan in place and are going on to logistics of how to um, make it available and work through the, the um, financial part of it next with a plan to roll it out this year. And then we kept work on the habitat suitability modeling. Um, we've completed a work on environmental variables and are moving on to um, human social factors that affect prairie dog habitat. 
So as far as uh, 2023 management accomplishments for addressing conflict on irrig irrigated agricultural lands, um, going back to addressing that northern project area, since that's been the area of interest in the last three years. Um, in 2021, when the initial expedited review project was initiated, we identified 967 acres of conflict. So again, prairie dogs on irrigated agricultural lands and impacting agricultural activities. As of 2023 um, of our mapping in the early fall, we have that down to 451 acres of conflict. So that's a reduction of over 53% in about three years of management since our lethal removals didn't begin until 2021. And that's happening, that has happened on 22 different sites. Um, restoration and rehabilitation of those agricultural lands have been completed on six sites, five of which are leased, um, almost complete on 10 sites, in progress on three and to be initiated on three sites. Um, I think for the most part, those are probably sites where um, removals um, went into late into last year and now they're dealing with winter conditions. So just can't really get out there yet. Uh, moving on to population monitoring for prairie dogs. We conducted our annual mapping in September and early October. Got it done in pretty quick time this year. Uh, we documented that prey dog occupations, so these are active acres on the OSMP system, decreased by 9.8% um, since 2022. So that's 4,687 acres occupied. We identified 111 active colonies. So this is down from 131 that were identified in 2022. And we uh, think that most of these contractions um, definitely include our removal efforts on irrigated agricultural lands, but also were due to the wet year we had last year. So we saw a lot of extensive vegetation growth and that often um, tends to contract or fragment prairie dog colonies where they can't keep up with the clipping of vegetation. And the vegetation gets too tall and they don't wanna live where uh, predators can sneak up on them. And uh, that contraction due to the wet conditions was um, documented elsewhere, like by the county as well. So I think that was kind of a front range, front range wide um, phenomenon last year. Talking about grassland preserves, again, the southern grasslands has met that 10% occupation target. The grassland management plan and identifies occupation target of 10 to 26% in those grassland preserves. Southern grasslands met that last year and it has maintained it this year. The other grasslands in the northern eastern preserves um, continue to be above our management targets. For associated species of concern, um, we monitor for burrowing owl breeding every year. This year, we identified two breeding sites, one on the eastern grasslands that did, uh, we observed at least one chick to fledge. And the southern grasslands, it appears that nest was unsuccessful. We also had badger observations this year. Um, these were um, recorded by Parks and Rec staff. Um, they had visual observations, put a game cam and got some cool pictures of a badger. Um, kind of west, northwest of uh, Boulder Reservoir. And a few members of the public had some observations as well. They're excited to share with us. Um, all the observations were in the first part of the year. We didn't have anything recorded after June. So we could um, confirm that removal activities and barrier stuff in that general neighborhood west of uh, the reservoir um, wouldn't impact any badgers that were using the area since we didn't have any more observations. Going back to the public meeting from December, our feedback from the public summary, um, we heard concern about prairie dog impacts on OSMP land. We heard concern about influence of nesting eagles on management decisions. And this was both concerns about impacts of prairie dog management and how that might affect eagles, but also concerns about how um, concerns about eagles would impact prairie dog management decisions. So both sides of that. Um, we heard from neighbors that had concerns about prey dogs coming on to their property and having conflicts. Uh, some members of the public expressed um, support for the benefit of Delta dust in managing plague and prairie dogs. There was support for um, following prey dog working group recommendations and requests for the grassland ecosystem management plan to be updated and to include a reduction of lethal control and increase implementation of prairie dog working group recommendations. 
Um, so moving forward to 2024 plans, going, going back to addressing those prey dog working group and general prey dog conservation, we're going to continue work on the prey dog, prey dog habitat suitability model and update, as well as moving forward with the cost sharing program with neighbors for prey dog barriers. Um, so that a plague distribution again will happen in the southern grasslands and any relocation take sites. Um, if we have them. We're going to enhance our discussions about feasibility of black footed ferret reintroduction. Um, this hasn't been a really urgent um, task. It is a prairie dog working group recommendation, but we have some neighbors, specifically um, the county and Rocky Flats, who've expressed interest in ferrets. So I think it'll be um, useful to start at least start the discussion internally for OSMP um, about what you know what what the plan might be for that. And then we'll have our annual fall mapping of prairie dog occupation across the OSMP system starting in September. For reducing conflict on irrigated agricultural lands, we are planning for relocation of approximately 18 acres from the Teller South property. Um, this is between Arapahoe and Valmont and um, 75th and 95th roughly. Um, this is going to be dependent on availability of receiving sites. We don't have any room within the OSMP system since the southern grasslands have hit that 10% occupation target. Um, we are, we will hear from the Pueblo Chemical Depot if they're going to accept more prairie dogs this year, but they're not making that decision um, until April timeframe. And it's possible that um, Rocky Flats may accept prairie dogs, but I haven't heard any details about that. If no receiving sites are available, we'll have to remove prairie dogs from this property also using lethal control, or potentially we could trap and donate prairie dogs to um, other wildlife recovery like um, raptor program or the ferret program. And then we're planning removal by lethal control on about 134 acres. Um, from agricultural lands. And so this is again expanding um, expanding this, this program to outside of the original Northern project area. Um, I can, I'm not gonna go through all the property names. I'll show a map instead. It's a little bit small on the screen, but it includes um, the biggest area we're looking at is Boulder Valley Ranch, portions of the hay fields um, directly west of the reservoir and east of the um, main ranch headquarters. Um, and then through the southern part of this, more, more southerly part of the map, um, kind of in a line from the Warner property and Hartnagel properties, which are removal sites along Valmont, a portion of the Teller North property, um, all of the Teller Middle colony, which is a pretty small isolated colony. Um, Teller South is where we're gonna plan for relocations if we have a receiving site. And then the Autry um, property is a hay field south of um, Arapaho. Um, then moving toward the south center of the map, um, looking at the Stratty Klein property and a portion of the Andrews property um, where there's prairie dogs in a um, orchard. Uh, and then north of Boulder Valley Reservoir, there's the Hester and DeLuca properties or hay fields. And north of that is the steel property that is gonna require um, more work to remove prairie dogs and rehabilitate that land and the irrigation system. Um, in addition to that, with the removals, we'll be moving forward to installation of barriers to prevent or at least minimize recolonization. Um, and then restoring those agricultural properties after prairie dogs are removed. Uh, a lot of this is gonna require maintenance and improvement of irrigation infrastructure. So properties where that's been identified is Boulder Valley Ranch, Steel, Autry, Oasis, Bennett, Belgrove, Johnson, South, and Stratton. Not all of these are removal properties for this year. They may have been previous removal properties or they haven't had any removals yet, but um, irrigation infrastructure has been identified as important there. And they're also going to continuation the lease of the uh, for the shared learning collaborative on the Minatrista Two property, um, where they're looking at different agricultural management options in the presence of prairie dogs. And that is all I have. If there's any questions, uh, 
I was trying really hard not to go first that time. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, uh, great presentation, lots of progress made. Uh, thank you for that. And I, I guess the only, only question I have is that I know there were some members of the community who really wanted an in-person meeting at our, at our update. Um, in, 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 right at the end of the report, it said that you would consider that. And I just wonder if we could make that commitment. I, I think that would send a good message, you know, you know, barring some unforeseen reason why we can't hold it in person, an in-person or hybrid, to say definitively at, at this point that that's our goal. I just feel like that would be a nice gesture. So I want to put that forward as my own suggestion. And, and if there's a reason we can't, you know, then so be it. But I, I think um, some of the people who are most passionate about this have a harder time communicating and feeling like they're being heard when they're looking at a screen. Yeah, I was saying just, anything about that yes. right away. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this year, one um, added complication that we had was that we had sent out the 900 postcards to adjacent landowners. So we were pretty uncertain of the number of people that we might expect. It's it's in the past been a relatively small group, and that turned out to be the case again this year, um, despite all of those postcards going out. Um, but with that uncertainty, and one thing that the that is somewhat limited in the city is larger facilities for hybrid meetings. So for instance, our community rooms at the hub can hold a lot of people, but they're not set up well to do a hybrid format. So um, they work well for in-person um, only. Uh, so we would definitely be looking next year to see what facilities are available. I know there's some technology upgrades planned in, in some of the, the conference rooms and stuff. So we may be in better shape to be able to do that next year. So the only other potential receiving site I maybe know of is um, Rocky Flats. Um, they have an agreement um, with Jefferson County. Again, it's, it's managed by that's you know, Fish and Wildlife. They have an agreement with Jeff Jefferson County to take prairie dogs and they do it some years and not others. Um, I haven't heard any official updates. Um, they tend to be pretty limited on how many animals they can take. Yeah, they tend to be pretty limited and, um, and it's pretty competitive. They have kind of an application system, um, first come first serve and it's full within seconds, minutes when it opens. So I can't say anything, even if they say they're gonna accept them, I won't know anything till if, if and when we decide to apply. Yeah, cause we wouldn't, we can't relocate if we don't have a place to put them. So the commitment is to remove prairie dogs from that land. So I think we decided rather than kicking the can down the road on the property, we'll remove them anyway. Um, and it would be lethal. Now we could decide if we want to do a trap and donate, in which case the animals are donated again to potentially rap raptor is food for raptor rehabilitation or black footed ferret conservation. Yeah, I think we're all in. So the, the equipment's been ordered, um, not yet delivered, and we have our um, standard position that will be running that program posted currently. So hopefully within a few weeks, um, that hiring process will conclude, and then we'll also be posting a, a seasonal position to um, help supplement that. And um, Andy is working with um, the county to see if maybe our crew can can train with their crew some if they don't already have experience in using perk or some of the other things that they're going to be working on barriers and that type of thing. So we certainly will have um, some training through the spring. Um, we don't use lethal control um, between March 1st and June 1st. So we really wouldn't be up and running to start lethal control until June 1st um, anyway. So that, that gives us the spring to get people 
trained and ready to go. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. And I mean, we're, we're optimistic. It should be um, very efficient. There will obviously be a learning curve and we're hoping that the, um, you know, the, the number, it is a large number of colonies that we're planning to do lethal control on this year and a relatively large number of acres as compared to what we've done in some of the past years. So um, ho hopefully everything will go smoothly and, and we'll be able to, you know, accomplish all of that um, earlier in the year than we've been able to do with contractors who have had scheduling limitations that have, have often made it stretch longer. Until March 1st. So although it certainly is weather dependent, it's more effective in, in certain weather. So, um, you know, as you get into the, the really um, cold part of winter, we tend not to do it just because it's not very effective and you often have to do repeated treatments. Uh, the other uh, comment I was going to make is that I certainly support the uh, suggested it also strikes me as this is an ongoing conversation over the past year. Um, <coughs> you know, kind of just face to face, you know, conversation with your neighbors, neighbors, uh, are particularly helpful too. And if you feel like you want to one or one on five or something like that. And it strikes me also that nice and I don't want to you know, hurt you, but it would be nice to kind of be able to say, look, you know, in addition to having a BLP, we met personally with, you know, X number of agency representative, whatever it is, that, so that people get a better handle on a better understanding of the kind of the interactions that are taking place on the ground. Yes, thank you. And we did not include that in the presentation or the memo, but that is one of our um, items that we're working on in 24 is to more closely track those interactions so that we can say exactly that um, in our in our 2024 meeting. Yeah. Uh, I did get feedback that the folks at home are having a hard time hearing the panel, so we just make sure either mics are on or we're leaning up to the mic. So. <laughs> Okay. That was probably me. <laughs> they didn't want to hear what I had. And me. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, thank you, Tori, for that. Uh, greatly appreciate it. Uh, we have great expectations for this year, and we'll look forward to hearing how it goes. Yep. So Thanks, thank Tori. Thanks, Heather. <clears throat> All right, yeah, Dave. I think you're still on. Yeah, I've got a few different scattering of uh, director updates. I'll try to keep within my five minutes. Um, uh, first of all, I just want to make a note of some upgrades, finally, to this facility that we're in. Council Chambers is going to be under a technology redo, remake. And what that means is we just got word of it uh, on Monday morning that Council Chambers is going to be out of commission for the month, uh, month of March. Leah and I are uh, going to be, well, we're already sort of deciding where we're going to be in March. And so we'll keep you updated on that, but it won't be here at Chambers. Uh, uh, City Council as well is moving to all virtual for the month of March. Uh, based on that, any boards and commissions that were slated in here have to find a different home. Uh, so we'll kind of keep you posted, but keep an eye on it and don't show up here on March 13th because you'll be alone. Well, you could help install TVs and cords and stuff like that. But other than that, we won't be here. Um, that uh, uh, brings a little bit of an interface to upcoming meetings. I just wanted to reiterate of our joint meeting next week uh, and anyone listening uh, in that on March 22nd, we're going to be teaming up, if you will. Oh, February 22nd, a week from tomorrow night, uh, this board will be joining city council uh, for an agenda item uh, to hold a public hearing on uh, the utility request for approximately 2.2 acres of open space, the Van Vliet property, as it's referred to, for uh, use and ongoing maintenance related to supporting elements of the uh, flood mitigation project. So that is at, uh, in this building at council chambers. Oh no, excuse me. That is a special meeting. So that is a virtual meeting as well, based on council rules. So uh, that will be supported virtually, uh, but it will be a combined meeting. Uh, Dave and I and Leah are meeting tomorrow, I believe, to kind of go over 
what what's the chair role in and and that type of arrangement and we're getting some clarity on the role of the mayor and the role of the chair uh, when we're uh, supporting a dual meeting so uh we'll get that we'll get links the board members will get links so that yep yep we'll get links and uh you will also tomorrow get the uh joint board council memo uh will be will be in your hands tomorrow uh so just uh, uh carrying on that public hearing uh item uh, uh the deliberations and consideration by this board will be at the march 13th meeting and council will be then deliberating and considering this board's recommendation on that item on march 21st uh at the council meeting so uh that's sort of how the sequence is going to be played out. And there will not be a, a public hearing at the March 13th meeting of ours? Uh, no, the public hearing port, the public testimony, the public hearing will be continued, but the public testimony uh, for the board will be held next Thursday. Uh, right, but so, will there be a public comment period for on March 13th? There'll be an open public comment open, period, yeah. but there will not be uh, public testimony related to the public hearing item um, at, at the March 13th meeting. Uh, so the other uh, uh, date I wanna make you aware of is March 14th, which is the day after the board meeting. We are welcoming uh, over a dozen tribal nations to the city of Boulder uh, for two purposes. One is that they expressed to wanting to conduct a private ceremony uh, amongst the tribal representatives themselves uh, uh, out at Settlers Park as part of the renaming process and the connection uh, that they've established, reestablished to that site. So in the morning, they're going to be holding their own public ceremony. But in the afternoon, uh, I believe it's from yeah, 1.30 to 5.30 at, at CU at the Williams Village Multipurpose Room, uh, uh, room at 530th Street. There's going to be an open public ceremony with our tribes and the members of public. I believe the city, city council members would be there. We really encourage any board members that are interested in being there. There'll be city staff there. Uh, it's really going to be an engaging, uh, uh, engaging session with our tribes. There'll be some uh, uh, panel discussions with tribal members participating in it. Uh, so we hope to have some good uh, dialogue and engagement. So uh, I, if you haven't, I believe you might have gotten uh, that sent out to you, but encourage you to uh, register uh, for that event. And in that regard, can you go back to the March, our March 13th meeting and just kind of give us a brief overview of what you anticipate the tribal board uh, yeah. component will be? So a little bit of wrinkle in that we thought we had this facility to work with. It turns out we're not. So we uh, want the identification of a, a, a site that can support uh, in person for board staff and tribal members is finding something that's large enough something that's conducive to a little bit more of a, uh, uh, you know, an appropriate sitting around a table kind of thing when we're, when we're working with the tribes, not so formal and to support the dinner. So uh, we're, I think we're, we whittle it down to just a couple of options and we'll let you know uh, what location we choose to support that with. But a five o'clock dinner is still uh, planned. So if you could uh, make note from five to six, we will be having a dinner with our tribal representatives that will be here to uh, 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 participate in the presentation of, on the Fort Chambers uh, site plan update to you all. Uh, and I believe it's final. Maybe I've knocked them all out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I did. Those are my verbal updates. Great, thank you very much. Uh, any further discussion and conversation from the board? I want the record to reflect <laughs> that we are adjourning uh, five minutes after eight, which may be actually a record. So <laughs> I declare the February 14th, 2024 Open Space Board of Trustees meeting adjourned. Thank you. Thank you all for coming and participating.